get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Leif Larson. He's founder of Leif's Natural Body Care. He started the company over 23 years ago with with a $15,000 loan from his family. I found Leif's because I was on a constant search for a natural deodorant that actually worked. That's the key. You know, I've tried a lot of them. Most of them don't work. And because I was reading, there is a huge amount of toxicity in using regular deodorant. And I found a friend recommended Leif's and like this stuff actually works. And so I want to have you on Leif to tell your stories and your journey. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for the opportunity to be on, Jeremy. Yeah, and I, I just pulled this out like, so we're going to talk about the products. I, I love to hear your how you develop a product, how you manufacture the formulation process, which we'll get into. But for anyone who can't see, this is the spray I personally use. Um, I buy like three at a time, so I make sure I don't run out. Um, so I always like to include a fun fact, Life, before we get into your journey. And a couple of fun facts, interesting fun facts is, one, you love playing the piano. Two, you spent 15 years and you work to advocate for poor people. And three, you have a B Corp certification. Mm-hmm. So tell me about that. What is well, a B Corp the, uh, certification? The B Corp certification is something that we're extremely proud of because it really aligns the company values with what B Corp represents. Yeah. And that is uh, using business for the greater good. Um, it's an extensive and challenging certification process one has to go through. They look at all the matrices, such as how you treat your employees, your pay scale, your benefit level, really? your products themselves, what the, what the products are, and how they provide a, a benefit or how they're better or more natural than, say, conventional products. And they look at all those kinds of things. They look at whether you, how you recycle in your office, you recycle really? matrices, hmm. uh, you know, environmental and and. and, 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 and situations that, that you have set up in terms of, of both we do we recycle everything so B Corp does um, measures those things and we were very delighted to get certified B, by B Corp but I also wanted to mention Jeremy yeah we were chosen as one of the top 10 B Corp companies in our category last year kind uh-huh. of gold status so we're quite proud of, of that that's, that's amazing what do you do differently in the office like with recycling or any of those things that that most businesses don't do well, I, I think it's a it's a mindset. Um, what we try to do is everything we do, we, whether it be recycling or um, how we communicate, needs to be very genuine, very um, you know good for things that we feel good about doing. Right. We feel good about recycling. We feel good about taking helping each other out. You know, it's really an attitude, and I think that's that was what came out in the B Corp certification is that we. We have sustainability practices that are in writing and they're very extensive. We do recycling. I mean, when I print a piece of paper to read um, anything, I'm always printing on recycled paper. It's, mm-hmm. We print it on one side of the paper. We make sure we use the other side. Mm-hmm. Our, our, our boxes are recycled. But it's not just the recycling. It's, it's really our attitude. We, we're, out, we're, there to, we're a team and we try to help each other out and make sure that somebody needs some help on this. We're there to help them out. We provide good benefits for our employees because – Happy employees are good employees, yeah. and what's more important than working in a company and having an environment where people feel good about their work and support each other? Yeah, yeah. So I want to start from the beginning and where this idea came from, but more to where you're from and what it was like growing up. And um, you're from rural South Dakota. That's right. So what was it like? A small town of uh, the, the the sign as you enter town said two thousand five hundred and eleven friendly citizens. Okay. I think that was probably uh, there were a few that weren't friendly, but that was pretty. 
pretty much, uh, I think, uh, uh, spot on. Yeah. Um, small town, small town values. Um, my mother was a school teacher. My father was an accountant. Mm-hmm. Um, they had met early on and, and spent some time in Seattle and then moved back to South Dakota. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, uh, I, I found living there was was a different life. And But, it, it, but the, the kind of rural life, agrarian life, people were salt of the earth and they were genuine and they were authentic and everything was on a handshake. What do you do for fun? Like growing up, what do you do for fun in rural South Dakota? We did, we were 25 miles away from the largest city, Sioux Falls. So we had movies, we had theater, Mm -hmm. we had concerts to go to when we got into high school and college. We, we played outside like everybody else played baseball, played football, Mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Um, but there were some quiet times. We did a lot of reading. We did, we, we lived next door to a park with a neighborhood swimming pool, and I remember every summer I spent my summer at the pool. It's enjoying being around water. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it, back then. It was you did a lot of reading. We didn't have a lot of. My mother didn't believe in television, so hmm. we read. We played board games. We engaged with each other. Mm-hmm. And you know, today I, I look at, at even my my grandchildren who are ages ten, eight, and six, and. They come in and they want to watch TV. They have like an iPad and an iPhone in their hands or something like that. And it's like, you know, it's like when you're sitting around, the t- you see those pictures of people all at a restaurant sitting around a table. It's a family dinner and everybody's on their phone. Right. And their iPhone checking. It's like, where, where's the engagement? Where's the community? And what we back then, of course, we didn't have an option. We had to play with our, 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 our sisters and our brothers and our, our neighbors. Yeah. And I think that was a good experience. How did your mom influence you? She was um, very uh, well read, and she grew up on a as a, one of nine children. Wow! Large farm just Holy outside cow. Of town in Canton, South Dakota. She uh, became a some somewhere along the way. She became a voracious reader. Went mm-hmm. back to college when she was in her forties. Got a degree. And just started reading, and she had had rheumatic fever twice as a child. I didn't know this until later. It was pretty serious. My uncle told me once that he remembers that they had a big farmhouse that she never left the upstairs bedroom of the farmhouse for a year. Wow! You know, she was just back then. Holy there was cow. there was nothing they could do for rheumatic fever except hopefully you'd you'd heal yourself. Yeah. Yep. The, the upshot of that, of course, she was supposed to live past the age of forty, and somewhere before around 40, she decided to, she must have stumbled across Adele Davis, either Prevention Magazine or one of Adele Davis's books, and started reading it and reading it. And all of a sudden, our lifestyle changed where mm. we were eating healthy foods, we were taking supplements. Um, she what, made, what year are we talking? Because like now that seems normal, this, this right? This is going to age me a little. This is talking about the 19, early 60s. Okay. I was about seven, eight, nine years old. Yeah. I mean, what kind of supplements do they have in the 1960s? She would order them um, and get a catalog in the mail. Mm-hmm. And she, they would arrive once every month or once every couple of months, a big box. And, um, of course, there was no internet. And right. she didn't get them on TV. So she would get a catalog and read. And what she would do is read Adele Davis's advice in her magazine or her book. And then she would order the supplements that Adele recommended. And I remember... Uh, as, as a child, every every dinner meal, we taken a handful of vitamins, and, and it would change every so often. We would, my, my, I, two, th- I had three sisters. I have three sisters, and uh, we'd ask mom, you know, what are we taking this time? How come it's a little, the little footballs look a little bit different? They used to be vitamin A, now they're vitamin E. But you would say, well, I'm not, I don't remember what what they are, but Adele Davis said they're really good for you. <laughs> so, like, I mean, as a ten year old child, you're not going to challenge you. I just use these. Reading and Prevention Magazine would arrive in a mm-hmm. mail. She would read that religiously. So before she got healthier and brought that to the household, what were the meals like? What were you eating before that? It wasn't – she didn't have the big garden. We had bologna sandwiches. We had potato chips. And we had Twinkie uh, Hostess um, desserts. Right. Yeah, yeah. Things that one grew up with in the 60s. right. And there was a, a significant change from that. So we had 13 grain whole wheat bread. We had fresh fruits and vegetables, those kinds of things. So, Leif, growing up, what did you want to be? What did you want to do? Gosh, I, you know, for the longest time, I didn't really have a notion. I, I did not want to stay in rural South Dakota. I, you, really, just, you didn't know what you wanted to be. You just didn't want to stay there. I wanted to get out and kind of – I wanted to see the world. And yeah. I wanted to see the sites and live in a larger city and 
be able to join, enjoy, enjoy more culture. And, you know, those are things that one doesn't get a lot of yeah. in, a, in a rural environment. It's interesting. So do you, have, do you have a vision at the time where you wanted to go? Because I guess you had movies, but you wouldn't watch TV. Is there somewhere like I, you see it in a movie, like I want to live there, I want to go there? I think my high school, which was a, a, a very unusual uh, private high school, mm-hmm. where the, um, the the president who had come in my freshman year was really sort of promoting this whole notion of social justice back in the late '60s. Yeah, and I think that instilled in me this notion of inequality and social justice, and we need to treat people with respect, and and, and th- those who are underprivileged and low income. Uh, need to be treated with respect yeah. and treated fairly, equitably, as well as everybody else. So I think that instilled um, some values in me in my high school years. And I, when I went off to college, I wanted to be a lawyer and and and, and fight for all the inequities of the world mm-hmm. and and to be a, a famed F. Lee Bailey type lawyer. I guess back then he was one who was well known around the world for fighting for the the underdog. Right. Uh, and uh, so that's that's kind of where I. I went and I, I then I, I got involved in a career doing some some neighborhood organizing and social justice and, uh, uh, and, and the last piece of that was some voting rights and helping increase participation in our democratic process amongst low income people and people of color. Yeah. So the first part of your career, like I was mentioning, the first fifteen years, you worked as an advocate for poor people uh, or, or lower socioeconomic. So what were you doing? Uh, we were um, mostly working with neighborhood organizations, low-income neighborhood organizations, mm-hmm. uh, helping people. Uh, 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 there were that, that was back in the uh, late, or early '80s, and the utility bill rates were going up mm-hmm. and getting their lights cut off because their, their light bills were, were being increased. Yet at the same time, the big volume users of electricity were getting discounts by you because they use, you know, of course, greater volumes. Right. But the message, of course, was that um, it, you're supposed to conserve energy. Well, if you conserve, then you get higher rates. So we were saying there was some inequity. <laughs> right. That makes sense. We're trying to get the regulated utility agencies to look at that and say there needs to be some incentives for conserving. I mean, in terms of especially amongst uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the whole uh, uh, rate structure. So yeah. those kinds of things, there was a lot of federal dollars that were supposed to go to, to communities for housing. They use some of those block grants to build convention centers, mm. get created jobs, uh, rather than um, you know housing or apartments yeah. for low-income people. So we were trying to uh, encourage people and help people use take advantage of their rights yeah. to speak to their elected officials and say, "Hey, there needs to be a better balance in terms of how our resources, our public resources, are spent." Yeah. You like know? so, what did you see? What were some of the worst conditions you saw working with lower-income areas? Saw some housing that was, I worked in the parts of Arkansas and then in Dallas, Dallas metro area. Um, parts of Arkansas where I was just shocked that people lived in those conditions. It was. Yeah. Like describe one of them. Like when you went in and you, what's a family that sticks out to you that you remember walking in and they, you couldn't believe they were living like that? Be a family of four or five, maybe six, dilapidated. Property had a screen on the window that was torn. Door, big gaps in the door. So with the wind blew, of course, the wind would blow completely through the property. Um, you know, it was the floors were wooden. There were, there were holes in the floor. Um, the furniture was was barely there. Um, but people, you know, it was amazing what struck me about people in those conditions. They were they were happy people. Yeah. They were who were grateful for what they had. And I look back at that today and say, you know, for for most of us. We were, have never been exposed to those conditions. We don't understand what it's like to really struggle and yet to be grateful that right. you, what, what little you have, you have. Right. That experience really put things in perspective. It, it really put it in, in perspective for me. And I was like, I was shocked. I, I didn't see that in rural South Dakota. I did see that in Arkansas. And I saw a lot of that in Dallas. I mean, Dallas had, in the 80s, had a lot of really low income pockets that uh, were really large communities, people that were struggling. and. And, and really just barely barely hanging on. Yeah. So when did you get into natural, like as a business, and not just doing it yourself? You know, that, and that's, that's, a, that's a good question. In, back in the 
early 90s, I was working for a voting rights project, and it was, it was funded by some national foundations that would support a public entity such as that. And uh, money ran out. It simply ran out. And they said, uh, we're going to lay everybody off. We're sorry. Our money's run out. And uh, there's nothing more we can do. So I, thought, I called a friend of mine, and I said, you know, I've been selling ideas and concepts for all these years. He had a small natural products company. And excuse me for the phone there. Um, That's like and, the, the lovely background heart music or something. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't planned. Um, so he said, come work for me. He said, I've got some natural products state I could, you could sell. I said, well, my mother, my mother was really into natural. So I said, I could probably, and I, 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 I told him, I said, you know, I, I can't sell things I don't believe in. Right. Because I've kind of done for, for 15 years, been, been selling product, ideas, ideas that I am very passionate about that I really right. believe. So I couldn't go out and sell Coca-Cola. I couldn't go out and sell, you know, beer. I mean, or I couldn't sell, you know, French fries or yeah, those kinds of things. Just something you personally believed in and that you did yourself. Yeah. I had to so he had he had some of the uh, crystal rock deodorants. He had some of these Ayate washcloths that said our skin exfoliating cloths. Yeah. He had a line of essential oils. And he had a magazine that he was, a natural magazine that he published and he sold through health food stores. So I went and worked for him. So what was what was the company called? Is it still around? A nonprofit. It was called the oh. American Botanical Council. Okay. Profit organization here in Austin. It's still around today. It is. Wow. So it had. What were the the products that attracted you the most? Because it sounded like there was a number of products. Well, I I I sold primarily two things: the uh, crystal deodorant stones, and we were um, selling a, a, another company. We we're um, we were a sales rep for another company, so I sold. Their products, and I sold these Ayate washcloths. And that's most, and I sold some of the Herbal Ground magazines, the subscriptions for health food stores, and that sort of after we sold through all that, then and I just went and worked on the on the side where we sold the products, the deodorant crystals and the Ayate washcloths, and I just sold them for weeks and weeks and weeks, primarily through um, direct sales, outside sales. Uh, to uh, retail, retail health food stores. So what does that look like? Do you go door to door and talk to the store owner? Are you calling places? I was calling stores and, and selling them. And it was, I had never been in sales before. I had never, and, and, and my boss said, you know, you set all kinds of sales records. We've never sold as much product before. He says, you know, yeah. it's amazing. I said, well, I, you know, I, I believe in this and I can sell it. And uh, so he was quite impressed. He was very impressed. And I, I, I sold uh, I remember it was in, in October, November, and I sold so many of these deodorant stones and these velvet pouches that I thought I was going to get a big check. And when the check came in, I only got a, we got a percentage of the sale and I got a percentage of our percentage. So, you know, as you do the math and those kinds of things, you end up getting very, very little. And I was just shocked that this is after work, after selling, sending all these sales records, working 12 hour days and, and creating I thought it was it was very huge, very significant sales, and he and my boss said the same thing. My check was a pittance, and I thought, well, I got to do something a little bit different. So I decided that then and there I needed to go out and become a sales rep and sell products myself. And I also had this notion that I could sell these deodorant crystals myself, put my name on it, and just import some from over from Thailand. So as you as you said in your intro, I got a, a loan from my family. Yeah in some products and my mother had had breast cancer at the same time oh wow she had a scare it was treated and everything was fine but we she always taught me to read labels well we were reading the labels on her on her on her mass market deodorant and her you know her motto was if you can't pronounce it avoid it well right. i couldn't it's any of those words and it was this is back in the you know early 90s and everything was chemicals so we thought you know let's 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 start selling this natural deodorant which we can pronounce, it's uh, mineral salts, it's um, potassium alum in its natural state. And uh, so that's kind of how I, by default, I guess I ended up um, going out on my own and I was, I was then a sales rep for a vitamin company and a tea company and some others as well. But I was starting my own company um, at that time. Leif, it's so interesting, so random that you were doing deodorant and these washcloths, it's amazing. So at the time, what was the education like as far as people thinking certain things were toxic or not toxic? Because obviously people have done a lot more research and studies. What was the notion then about deodorant? 
I, I think people didn't really understand what natural deodorants were all about. There yeah. really weren't, weren't much on the market. The only thing that so how was, did you because this is interesting because you're going in, you're selling large numbers of these things, and they're like, "Well, I could just get this other stuff." What were you telling them? What, what was we your sales pitch? Talked about. I, I what well, part of my sales pitch was if you can't pronounce the word, you really should avoid it, and right, right. would then stand there and try to read the back of a of a of a product label in a store. Right. They'd say, yeah, I don't know how to say this word. And I said, well, what do you think it is? They said, I have no idea. So well, you're putting it on your body every day, seven days a week, yeah. 165 days a year, 20, 30, 40, yeah. 50 years. And if you don't know what you're putting on your yeah. body, what do you think is, is, is happening? What, what do you think right. is going on? And then, and then we would talk about breast cancer, which, is continue, which, which rates continue to rise in the West. Talked about all the, all the tumors and, and other kinds of cancers in our Western world, and people were starting to make some links between had all the extensive use of parabens and other other toxic preservatives in skincare products. Yeah, and then natural personal care and natural deodorants. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about those things, but to me it makes perfect sense because, you know, if you know a small amount of anatomy, you know you have lots of lymph nodes in that area, and then you're putting toxic things over the lymph nodes every single day. And I was just at one point like, okay, this is crazy. I can't keep doing this. And it makes perfect sense. What are some of the things people should look at and avoid that is toxic that they may have no idea? We have a toxic 10 list on our website at yep. lifestyle.com. Yep. All the things that we don't use. And those are the those are the kinds of things that are used in common deodorants, yeah. personal care, things like uh, aluminum chlorohydrate and aluminum zirconium, which are in most mass market deodorants. Yes, yes. The parabens in them. Um, triclosan is used in a lot of soaps. It's very unhealthy. Um, those, are the, the, those are the kinds of things in deodorants. But I think... Um, do your research, look at those ingredients. If your product, if your deodorant especially has a drug panel and almost everything in a conventional supermarket does, if it has a drug panel, a warning panel on the back, it's, it's, it's not natural and it's right. got toxic ingredients and the FDA is regulating that product for that reason. Yeah. I, I remember reading on your site, it's a lafes.com slash mission and like talks about propylene, uh, glycol, parabens, the Tri like can't even pronounce them triclosan and then there's obviously petroleum mineral oil fd and c colors and dye i was actually surprised about the mineral oil what's what's bad about that well mineral oil is you know what people don't realize it's a derivative of, of uh, petroleum okay it, it's a byproduct of the distillation of petroleum mm. so you're putting i tell my friends that say what's wrong with mineral oil i said well let's go out and buy a can of 10w40 motor oil and Put it on your skin. I mean, that sounds horribly gross. <laughs> is a very cheap byproduct, and it has really no 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 medicinal or health value. Yeah, I think you know, and it's it's used in everything from a lot of lip balms, a lot of conventional lip balms use it. A lot of uh, conventional lotions use it because it's a it, it, it it's a cheap uh, sort of oil to put in there. And if you don't know what it is, you say, oh, it's a it's an oil. It's obviously going to help. Uh, you know. Uh, put nutrients and put moisture back in my skin. It yeah. really doesn't do that. So what you get a fifteen thousand dollar loan. Um, does that take some convincing? Or it does a little bit. It does. A, it did a little bit. My family was like, "What are you going to do with this, Leif?" <laughs> I mean, it's, that's a lot of money back then. And right. Not been in business before. Right. I I, I did. I I was I, my father helped. Uh, he came on board. And he said, "Okay." We ordered product from some of the deodorant crystals from Thailand, and we started selling them. How did and, you find? Did you just backtrack on what they were, where they got them, or how did you even find a place in Thailand that show you know that sold deodorant crystals? I had a friend who was who had bought some from Thailand. He was in uh, based in uh, he was out in out Phoenix, and I had met him at a trade show, and he said, "Hey, I know where you can get these," and I and I uh, I called this person and. And then one night I had, I was, this is when I just started my business. I had my fax machine in my bedroom because I didn't, I had home office. And about two o'clock in the morning, my fax machine went off and I thought, wow, I got up to see what it was. And it was a returned 
response from the supplier in Thailand I was wanting to buy product from. Mm. I was so excited I couldn't get back to sleep because it was my first order. She faxed me a, a, a confirmation of my order and an invoice. And I thought, I'm in business. Now that I have the funds, I can send her the money. And she's going to send me the product. So. Did you spend all of it on product or what did that? I on product. I had an office. I did had a home office for a number of years starting off. And I just used an extra bedroom. And I had product shipped to my to my house. Mm-hmm. Used my, my I used my garage for uh, for storing it. And that's I, I was you know when you when you start off on a business and you don't have a lot of resources, you do whatever you need to do. Do it inexpensively. And I right. think I was, I was the master at doing that. You know, so what that. did the labeling look like, and what did you do with that? I mean, does it come? How does it come? And then what do you do with it? We it came. Uh, it was unlabeled. It was the bulk products. We made a label, and we would um, uh, we had uh, some of it was uh, we would staple the product the product to the label. Other other part of the product we had a like a header card attached to it. We had a couple three different labels, very simple labels. We had them made up, and we actually went on and bought some clip art. Got some free clip art actually um, that we purchased. We, well, no, it's free. We didn't purchase. We just we just said you get free and you can use it. So we used it. And people started telling us how they liked our logo. It's like, well, this is just free clip art. But <laughs> I will, of course, want to tell people this was some free clip art that was, you know, open to the public. But uh, we use that, and that's kind of how we, that was how we got started. And then we we over over time decided we wanted to make a roll on, so we had a roll on. And that spray that you use, which is what I use, I love that spray. Yeah, that was our that was our our second product product line after the the Crystal Rocks, and then we made a roll on. So. Is the label the same as it was then, or is it different? Oh, we've gone through many, many, many. Okay. Evolutions. So, what? Okay. Give me a visual. What did the label, the clip art, look like then? And and tell me the the progression, evolution of the actual label. It, it had a uh, a bird kind of flying over right. water. Is that the, the same as now? It's same as now. Okay. We, when we've done different sort of different evolutions of that for the last fifteen years. And we've just finished a complete rebrand, and we've just done away completely with the bird, the moon, the ocean. You did. I love the look, but the experts say hey, you got to upgrade to something a word brand, and that's the direction we, we, we we've gone. Yeah. So if people look at it. Um, it's interesting. So you can see. I don't know if you can see it on there. I'm gonna hold it up. But yeah. So there's the bird, the sun, the ocean. I'm always curious about the you know the labeling and branding so what is it going to look like now it just is a word brand it just says lafes we added the apostrophe back and i mean we had it when you do the, the the branding it's it's it every little thing is debated do we have an apostrophe s do we not have the apostrophe s we went back with the apostrophe s because the expert said it's a because there's a person people don't always nothing uh, Connect the brand with the person, and the apostrophe s shows possession, and therefore they'll they'll understand this is an actual a human being with a name. That's the person's name. They so. just put your face on the bottle, and they can see this is Leif right here. They didn't recommend that, Jim. Thank goodness. You're not. They said you're not pretty enough, or what they tell you? I just uh, well, my face wasn't going to cut it. <laughs> so you go from the crystal to the the spray, and then to the roll on. Um, at what point and why do you decide to expand and go to the spray? We, we, we thought we needed to do, to do something different. We needed to add more products. And as we were growing the company, we realized that there's a market for these products. And everybody is, we're all different. Some people like the product in, uh, and some people didn't like the rock. They said, I don't want the rock. How does the rock work? I mean, people still use that. Yeah, it's a, it just it's 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 a mineral salt that kills the bacteria. Yeah, the surface of the skin, and it doesn't leave any residue. You can't tell it's there, but it kills bacteria, and bacteria is what causes body odor. So, right. what we have to do is eliminate body odor, because what natural deodorants do is eliminate the source of the problem. Right. Whereas conventional deodorants eliminate. They, they they get in the pores of your skin and prevent you from sweating, which is very unhealthy for yeah. us. So yeah. But, we went back and we thought, let's try to make a roll-on and let's try to make some scented product. We made a spray then, a spray first, and then we made the scented roll-ons. And it was just kind of evolution. I mean, people yeah. suggested things and, and we said, okay, let's do it. And, and we, we try to listen to suggestions as a small company. It was, 
if you if one listens to their con their consumers, their 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 retail partners, they they give you great advice. Great. Mm. Yeah. What advice did you get early on? Because you're doing the same thing you were doing before. You're calling on stores, right, and supplying these stores, and you're getting feedback from what the customers are telling the retail owners. So what what kind of advice were they telling you? I, I, one of the things, a piece of advice I, I, I was I was given was to you need to take some risks, and I was so afraid to take risks. What does that mean? See, what did that mean to you? That means not be afraid to fail, and you know we're all afraid to fail. I mean that's that's, yeah. a, that's a natural process. But I remember telling my father who gave me the fifteen thousand dollar loan. I, I said, he said, oh, don't take any risks. You know that's be be conservative, and he was a very conservative. Right. We were sitting down there looking at early on. I, I think my first year I was in business, I had sold a hundred thousand dollars worth of product. That's amazing! This, wow, I, I'd sold a hundred and twenty thousand. One hundred and twenty thousand. Now that is a twenty percent increase. Well, I thought if I do a twenty percent increase in sales every year, I'm never going to get very big. I'm going to be extremely small for a long time. So I've got to go from a, t a ten to twenty percent increase to a two, three, five, and tenfold increase. Mm -hmm the company I want to I want to own it to be someday right so I told my father that I said you know thanks for your advice but I've got to take I've, I've got to take advice elsewhere I've got to I've got to do a different program yeah. and I learned to take risks I learned yeah. that uh, you know, oh it's a gamble you, you 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 take out bank loans you you take out credit cards you hire people to help run your company yeah. and you don't think you can afford that but you know in the end that's that's the you believe in your product and you know you're going to make it work. Yeah. And what's interesting is, you know, that advice did get you a certain point. You know, it keeps you, your cash flow going early on, but then at some point you decide you want to expand. So what risks did you take that you look back and they really paid off? And what risks did you take that, okay, if I went back, I would definitely not do that again? I, I, think, ex I think hiring... A national sales manager hiring. We have a VP of international sales. Those are things that we've done, um, and those were a risky propositions because that was a that was an expensive commitment to make. Yeah. But it's an important one to grow the brand, and that's one I have no regrets over. We yeah. we are now growing exponentially on the export side. Yeah. It's got a big market for us. But uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, and I think I was one risk I, I didn't take is. We had a twist stick deodorant that was not a good formula, and it has caused us huge issues in the marketplace, and it also probably caused some brand damage. And we continued work, working with the manufacturer, we kept trying to change the formula, couldn't get it right. We finally changed to a different manufacturer and a completely different formula, but we waited too long. What was and, wrong with the formula? Like, what were people complaining about? Yeah, the, the, it was a vegetable based glycerin, it was kind of a hard product. As it would get hot and cold, it would the oils would kind of separate. You mm. see oil and sticky stuff on the outside of the, the container, and we, we tried to fix that. And it was like after years and years of this, um, we finally changed to a completely different product, different manufacturer, completely different formula. But we waited too long because it yeah. cost. But it's so sometimes, and people told us you need to change, you need to fix that. And at some point, I should have pulled the trigger and said, "Okay, I got, I can't keep doing this." You know what they say about you do the same thing over and over, you're not going to get different results. Right. And, and I think I learned that sometimes you have to just bite the bullet and make that change early on, yeah. and, you, and maybe you know go a little longer and hopefully fix it. Sometimes that that, that works against you. Yeah, like if there's so many moving parts, which which is so interesting. I mean, we're talking about formulation, manufacturing, sales. You know, when you're talking about products, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So the positive side, the risk, the sales manager, what else did you see looking back? Like, yes, this really paid off because I took this risk. I think one of the, one of the, the challenges, uh, what was interesting was when I uh, moved from a home office into a, a real office. Um, that just so how far along were you at that point? Like how many years? We were probably 10 years in. Oh, 10 years. Wow. I, we we stayed home for a, I kept it out of my I had a house I had I had uh, bedrooms that we used for at, uh, offices and it worked very well. Um, but where were the shipments? They would come in there and where would they go? We would I could I have a, I, had, I had a storage warehouse and then I also had a garage where we would ship out of. So it was pretty convenient and it worked well. But I think moving into a commercial 
location is just it it makes the business kind of grow up it forces the business to grow up yeah to become a different kind of a business i think another thing i did is i had some of my family working in the business yeah my sons were great and i taught them sales and i'm proud they've all moved on and i really big in sales but they probably stayed in the business too long they should have been moved out a little more quickly because i think having family in a business can be very challenging and very and we had our challenges with 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 i have had my challenges with family it all it's all good now but yeah. uh Sometimes it's better. It forces you to look at the business as a real business it's enterprise tough. and not just a family a family business yeah. of helping your sons and your, your children out. What have you found the toughest with working with family? Because it is a it's a balance. It is a balance, and it, it's well, it's very difficult to enforce rules, and very difficult to enforce uh, to write up a family member who right. shows up late or doesn't show up for work. Um, or, or makes a big mistake that they should have known better. I mean, of course, then you're going to see them that night or in a couple of days later uh, in, in, a, in a family environment, and it's 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 hard to wear both those hats. So yeah. I I found it was that was that was a challenge. What a challenge. do you advise people who are maybe thinking about hiring family member or who are currently working with a family member? Try to have it's ideally it's good if you can have somebody else kind of manage and oversee mm. that family person. So I you want supervisor yeah that's really helpful because then they're accountable to somebody besides besides yeah. um, i think that's good I, I think i think one has to remind and i have a lot of friends who have family in business yeah. remind their 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 family employees that yes they may think they're very valuable but if the, the job <laughs> industry would pay pay scale is 12 to 14 dollars an hour that's what you make you don't make 16 to 18 because you're you're you're, you're you don't get sp- special treatment Precious family goods, right. and I think that's what happens from most of my friends that have family is that they say, "Yeah, I'm probably paying him or her more than I should be." Yeah, I want to go back to the sales manager because that's interesting, and and obviously you found that paid off really well for the company and the business. You know, when you do that for the first time, and you're not sure. You know, I never had a national sales manager. Where do I find one? How did you navigate that? Uh, through contacts, primarily through contacts, I, I found somebody. I did some interviews, and I, I found someone I was quite comfortable with. And we had took me about a three month process, uh, talking to different people, finding out what I thought was the best fit. And one of the messages that I would tell your listeners is: go with your intuition. Mm-hmm. I have my, my wife said the other day. She says, "You know, Leif, you have this incredibly good intuition. And if you go with your intuition, ninety five percent of the time." It, it comes out good. It comes out okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I went with my intuition. I hired somebody who I felt was a good fit for us. Yeah. And it's turned out to be a very good fit. So, but it's, you know, it's, one never knows. And, you know, it's, I, I hired, I looked at some people that were, I thought were, were um, very talented, very skilled, would have brought a lot more perhaps yeah. company, but they were very clear that I'm going to work X number of hours and boom, when I'm done, and it's like, well, sometimes we need more than X number of hours. Some weeks we're going to need more. We got a trade show. We got a big a product launch coming out. You know, if you're going to say after X number of hours, I'm no longer available, that's difficult for us. So, right. You need someone who takes ownership and is sort of in their own right entrepreneurial that they kind of take it upon themselves. That's right. And and somebody has has that sense of, 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 of a small company. And, and passion for what we do, who's fl- who's flexible yeah. you know, in terms of their schedule and their ability, and and understands that it's not just a job; it's 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 a passion. It's something that we really really um, feel feel good about. Yeah. How do you? What were you looking for? Because people oftentimes in interviews can sell the world. You know, like yes, I would treat this business on my own, I'll work any hours, and then it turns around. So how did you find that person? What qualities did you see in that person? Because I was talking to someone who does hiring on a regular basis, and they still said their 60% success rate. You know, at least 40% of the people they hire still don't work out. So I'm curious on your what you look for. I was standing next to this person at a t- trade show up in Toronto, Canada for two days. And I didn't know her. She was in the booth next to me. And so we were there for two days 
talking, uh, you know, just just getting to know each other. Yeah. Uh, she worked for another company. And um, I guess spending two days next to somebody, and when I'm at a trade show, I, you know, you're kind of on, you're always talking to everybody. And when the, the aisle was slow, I talked to the, the people next to me, and she was there. And she told me she was interested in doing some, in taking on some more clients. So I thought, and she was interested in hearing more about uh, my company and if I had an interest in a national sales manager. I said, yes, I did. So we, so we kind of had a two-day interview, if you will. And uh, mm. her partner came over. And I talked to her partner. So I really had an opportunity to work close with her for uh, an extended period of time under a kind of a, uh, now I would say a real stressful, but a trade show kind of environment. You kind of saw a, working, saw her wor at work. At work, uh, yeah. doing things, and, and how she presented herself, how she communicated, how she engaged with people. And she said to me, she said, I've never seen anybody at a trade show ask people the questions you ask. And I, I always say to people, um, um, so how, so how can I help you? Or I just, I, I try to engage people. I'm not trying to sell them my product, but I want to engage with them to see what, what they think about the product, the weather, um, and, and just, just, you know, get people to Be talk. Personable, yeah. And she said, she said, you know, what struck me is that you ended up engaging with people over your products without even intentionally trying yeah. because that's where the, the, the conversation moves towards. But, uh, but she was very observant, I think, and she kind of knew, she saw my passion for what I, what I do and passion for making authentic and genuine products compared to others in my industry who don't. And I think that was a, that's where there was a connect. So what kind of company, did they have a national, like a sales manager company or did they sell, was she selling products for another company? She was, they were national sales manager because they had a couple other lines in which they, they worked with. So they were experienced in doing yeah. yeah. So if someone's looking for something like that, then they can go to some specific company and, and interview them. They were a small company. It was a two person company, which oh, is, okay. you know, which is kind of, we're a small company and we like those small companies because big companies don't always give you the, the attention that you would like. And they're used to dealing with the larger clients who have mega dollars. So, so, Leif, what was another thing? So it seems like the sales, hiring that sales manager really helped exponentially grow the business. What else has, has helped? I think the learning about product development. And I yeah. think that, um, as I mentioned, my stick, making decisions um, and, and making them. And I, I think if, if you think you need to make a decision and you put it off, you know, delay is worse than making them by the wrong Delaying the decision is worse than saying not making a decision. I've learned that from Darren Hardy and, and Success Magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, with, I, I listen to those interviews and I read those those, those books in his magazine. You know, you have to take risks and you have to make decisions. And if you make a mistake, you can always fix it. If you don't make a decision, you just you post you just postpone. Things. Right. So, what did the products look like after? So then you have the spray, then you have the roll on. What was next? It was the sticks. The sticks? The sticks have been the biggest challenge I've ever had. We've had probably a dozen different people make deodorant sticks. And it's... Why? It's, it's crazy. It's, it's current. They're difficult to make. Yeah. It's the most current manufacturer is the one who we feel good about, makes a good product, and we're, we're excited about. Other than that, um, we've just... People who really didn't know what they were doing, they didn't know how to make it. Um, they would make product for us, but they wouldn't... They wouldn't they wouldn't back up their, their product. And so we just didn't like the fact that we were buying product. It was, I thought of, it was, it was okay quality, but not superior. quality. And yeah. the other question I always had is when I would be visiting with these plants, the one question that people would ask us is, you know, if you just would use propylene glycol, and they'd have big barrels of propylene glycol. I see. They say I can make your product for less money. It'd be so easy to make. I said, no, we don't use propylene glycol. Right. Um, other natural brands use propylene glycol, but that's a that's another petroleum derivative. It's right. not a natural product. Right. It doesn't burn on the skin. Um, so we had to we had to stick with our guns, I think. Yeah. And say, no. Do you ever say just think about like forget the sticks? Like I don't even need to sell sticks, or just it's such high demand that you you have to fill that need. But the sticks tend to drive the category. And yeah. it's, it's important to have a good stick. And, yeah. Um, like I said, we've, we went through a time where we didn't have 
the stick like I, I really felt we should have, the quality of the stick like we should. And, uh, and so we're, we're there now. I'm really glad that we, we've made that change. But, you know, it's, I was reluctant. And, and, you know, so many times I find if, I, if, um, if one is, is afraid to make that change, um, you don't do it, you put it off, it comes back to, to, to bite you later. And right. for me, and many times in life I've said to myself, I should have, I was going to do this, I didn't do this. It was a mistake to, to, to delay. Yeah. So I would just tell people that it, it, if they feel that there's a change that needs to be made, don't fear it. Yeah. And if, if you fail, you fail. I can tell you one of our one of our one of our, our biggest failures is is uh, we have a baby product line and it sells in Asia. We don't sell much in the U.S. and we have this fantastic product the packaging, pro, uh, the plastic. And I speak here. Uh, it's a it's a special patented plastic bottle. Huh. It, it's it's called we call it baby safe plastic. It's a patented. Um, process that is used <clears throat> in the molding of the, of the product, hmm. and what and it doesn't have any of the, any of the, the conventional toxic chemicals in most plastic. And wow. those chemicals all leach. Uh, they're called endocrine disruptors. They all leach into the body. Yeah. We have a baby safe plastic in six of our baby skews, and it is the hardest product to sell in the U.S. We can sell it in Asia. It Why? Asia. In the U.S. market, we tell people it's a baby-safe plastic, and they look at us and say, "Well, I think it, the challenge is it, it's a it's a uh, it's a longer conversation." People like the fact that it's doesn't have endocrine disruptors. It doesn't have all the estrogenic activity. It doesn't have all the bisphenol A and the phthalates and all the other chemicals. Um, but I think we're probably ahead of the curve. I think that the consumer here in the Western world is really not quite there yet on on the dangers of plastics. Yeah, we know they're all not good. We don't want to drink water out of a plastic water bottle. We need to be careful that, you know, you don't want to feed baby out of a, you don't want to use plastic bottles now in babies unless they're EA free. But right. for the consumer, I think we're a little ahead of the, of the hmm. curve and people, at least in the U.S., don't really understand the importance of that. So what we have to do is we have a product that we thought was far superior than anybody else's product. Even the people out there who say, I have the best natural baby products out there. We say, well, what kind of plastic are you using? And they say, oh, this kind of stuff. But this, is, this, this conventional plastic is leaching all kinds of chemicals in your liquid. You, you may have a really nice organic and all natural formula, right. but you're dumping, it's leaching. I shouldn't say the word dumping, but right. it's leaching toxic chemicals into that liquid. And then you're putting it on the baby's skin, it's getting into the baby's body. Right, but sometimes it's hard to sell things. It's hard to sell those ideas because the consumer isn't there yet. And uh, I think that's one of the things we had to get away from our baby safe plastic. It's expensive. We thought it was a grand idea, and the feedback from a lot of people were, "It's a phenomenal idea," but yeah. uh, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't sell well in this market. So, Leif, how do you discover? Okay, let's sell it in Eastern countries. You know, we marketed in China and in parts of Asia. Uh-huh. And I think part of it is in those cultures, you know, they're, they're, they want the best for, the, for their, their niece or their nephew or their child. And there's, their families are having so few children that they will search out and, 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 and do the education to, to determine why this product is superior. We have a lot of information online about how baby safe plastic is so much better than it's next to glass. There's nothing better than, then, then baby glasses is the most perfect thing, right. but that, that shatters and you don't yeah, want baby getting a hold of glass. So, but they would read up on it and they would say, oh, I like this baby safe. And so we're hearing from China that they like this feature. So, um, so I think it's a little, it's just a little, you know, we're in a much faster sort of paced market. I think, you know, Americans don't always take the time because we're so busy to, to do the research and understand the benefits of everything. Yeah. I mean, how does that work, though? I mean, obviously, you have sales channels distribution in the U.S. How much harder is it than to go into international? It isn't hard, and we, we love export. We're, we do more export. We're almost doing more export than, than uh, U.S. And, can, and Canadian sales. Probably really? next year will surpass it. There is a huge demand for U.S.-made personal care all over the world. We, we still have the highest standard of manufacturing, the cleanest products, and the rest of the world understands it. And we tell people that we're, we're, 
we love exporting to China. We love exporting to all these other countries. It's it's you know it's great for our economy, and it's good for our company, of course. But it's also great that we can provide those children products as as good, if not better, than the products that people are buying here in the states. Yeah. Leif, so what does that look like? Is do you have people just calling on big retailers in China, or how does that work? Well, China is a bit tricky. Um, it requires a product. Uh, extensive product registration, uh, product testing, uh, including animal testing. So we do not sell in China except online. Online mm-hmm. exceptions to that. But if you sell in a retail store in China, the product registration process requires you to do animal testing, which we will not do. Mm-hmm. That will probably change in the next year or two. But for now, um, we've got our VP of, of international sales. He has contacts that from previous work. And um, he introduces our products to people, and it's uh, you know export isn't as difficult as some people are led to believe. It's it's our fastest growing channel for us. We're now in over 25 different countries, mm. and we're going to continue to grow, we, we, especially on the export side because it's it's uh, I think we, it takes less resources to grow on the export. The U.S. market for natural product is very saturated. There's a lot of companies out there, and there are new ones starting up all the time. Yeah. So. It's just much more of a competitive marketplace. Because you formulate and manufacture in the U.S., right? We formulate and manufacture everything in the U.S. Yes. So then you're shipping everything over to, like you just ship in bulk over to China then? Like if someone orders online or? Well, we, we, we ship, we, we sell um, product, package product um, to China. In fact, we have a bug spray that's extremely popular. It's, hmm. a, it's an organic oh, right. spray. Nice. And Number two selling product in Yahoo Taiwan. Wow! There, who's got it on? Uh, and so, certified organic bug spray. It's a, it's a geranium-based product. But we do. Uh, we, export is interesting in that um, once you set up that relationship, and export's about relationships. And that's another thing I, I really emphasize to people. It's a, as your small business, it's important to have a relationship with everybody. We have a relationship with our our, our, our trucking company. We have a relationship with our with our manufacturers, um, with our bank. And it's those relationships, those personal relationships are so valuable and, and just make business so much easier that um, I can't emphasize the importance of getting to know your, your, your sales rep for your logistics company. Because um, he or she, when you get in the jam, you don't know what to do and you're trying to pull your hair out. I have found that um, I think I am the master of knowing a little about a lot of things. Right. And a master about knowing not a lot about much of anything. <laughs> I don't think you didn't say that quite right, Jeremy. But uh, I get your drift, though. <laughs> generalist, I guess I. Uh, and and you hire I hire people and I look for people for for advice and support. Yeah. And it's out. It's a matter of asking. So, what other interesting products do you make? So you make the the different lines of deodorant, the natural bug spray. What is the baby product? What is that for? We've got a baby a shampoo. Okay. A, Wash, shampoo and wash, a bug spray, a massage oil, kind of kind of more baby products. What was next? So you started with the deodorants. What was the next product line that you expanded to? And then in 2011, we purchased a hair care brand, and that was a really good hmm. decision for us. It was it was it was a really it was a milestone because it got us into hair care. Um, we bought a little company in New York that sold a really has a really nice shampoo and conditioner product, and uh, we wanted to get away from being deodorant because that's what we were known for yeah that's because people say well usually you're the guys that make deodorants and then they say I mean, we say yes but we want to make more than just deodorants because it's a very limited category if you don't and especially we find this on the export side our export partners will say okay we we like your deodorants what else do you make well if we don't offer anything else we've already li- limited you know our ability to uh, to supply them products so hair care is a huge category First acquisition was the hair care company in 2011. In 2014, we launched one of the first dry shampoos, which is 100% all-natural, GMO-free product. Hmm. It's a powdered product that um, helps extend time between shampooing of hair. And our product is, is a tinted product that blends with your hair color. And we tinted it. We actually got the idea from a guy in Whole Foods Market in downtown Chicago oh. as Guys were biking to work. They were they would change clothes, but the hair was all wet. So they wanted something that would absorb all the oils and the moisture in their hair. 
So then we sort of shopped the idea around about dry shampoo. Well, lo and behold, dry shampoos were were in vogue in the 60s and 70s. I've never even heard of that. Yeah. About these dry shampoos. And you go to Ulta and these big mass marketplaces, they sell cans of dry shampoo, some toxic spray stuff with butane in it for $30. Well, we decided to make a dry shampoo powder that's all natural. Wow. So we lost that in, uh, in last year. And it's been a, 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 a it's one of the first dry shampoos that's completely natural as, as a tinted powdered product. Wow. And one of the directions that we're going with the company is we want to go more to salon kind of products because yeah. there aren't very many salon products that are natural yet. Yeah. And we can help make that happen. So yeah. our, our formulation challenge is, is how do we become a leader in product innovation and not just another Me Too company? People ask me, Leif, like, why don't you make a toothpaste? Why don't you make a, 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 another body lotion? Yeah. Why don't you make a uh, shaving gel? I said, no, there's a lot of shaving gel out there. There's a lot of brands that make a lot of that product. We don't want to be a Me Too company. We don't want to be a wannabe company. We want It's got to be authentic and, na- and completely natural in terms of its formula. Yeah. So that's our next our next challenge. We've got a, a product in the works that's going to be, it's going to slow hair growth. It's an all-natural product. And there is a, uh, a oil out of South America that softens the fol- follicle and slows hair growth. Can so you just the- invent something that starts hair growth? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> My <laughs> wife would come and kiss you. No, I'm just- Jeremy, if I could, I would send you. I'd send you. <laughs> Actually, I have a, I have a, uh, I have a uh, uh, pomade, uh, hair pomade. I'm going to send you. And you okay. need to use it because you might be surprised at the results. We don't make hair growth claims. I think hair growth claims are really iffy. Yeah, There's a lot of them out there, and you're opening yourselves up to lawsuits and complaints. If you say, right. Jeremy, you're going to have a full head of hair in a year if you just use my product. Right. Now, you may not be talking to me, and your wife may not want to. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> How did the purchase of the hair care, so 2011, that sounded like a, a great direction that you wanted to go. How did that come about? How did you find that company? It was we we saw it as uh, just listed on a, on, a, on a company for sale site, and gentleman was retiring. It was a kind of an ethnic brand. It was a product that um, was geared for African American, Latino, Asian hair. Hmm. Or so for they they marketed as coarse, kinky, curly hair, and uh, a great formula. So we picked it up. It was sold in a lot of the nat- uh, natural food stores, larger food stores oh, nice. like, like Whole Foods. So we so we knew that there was already it was in the marketplace. We didn't have to have to launch it and sell into. Um, and uh, so we picked it up and we did some revisions to it, and uh, we just negotiated a sale and picked up and kind of ran with it. And really, we were able to blend it with our current product line. One of the things that we I think looking back, we didn't make it a lace product. It was you called. Didn't. We did. We, we kept it as branded as Earthly Delight. Okay. We put our Leif's logo on the front, but for the consumer, people didn't see it's a Leif product. So yeah, branding is important, I think, and it's important that you brand kind of loudly and let people know that this is part of your brand. If you know, if we look at if you look at a, a, a Dell or a, a, an Apple's an Apple product, there is there is their logo all over that product. We didn't do that like we should have, and I think it would it would have made a difference. We have now made that change, but. Yeah. Early on, we didn't understand the importance of, of branding in terms of the of, of product association with the product. With the brand. So, when you brought them on, what things did you have to revamp? Well, first of all, we had to uh, get our sales reps behind the product line and say, so "All of a sudden, we've been selling deodorants now for the, all these years. Now we're selling in a new channel, new, a totally new category." Right. It's hit. So we made some sample sizes, sent those out to people, said, try this product. Because we, we know that if you try it and you like it, you can speak firsthand about the product. And hopefully you'll have a good, a good experience with it. So we did a lot of um, just sampling. We did some demos in some retail stores. We made new sales literature. And, and we did a lot of just talking about how it's unique and different, how it's different from all the other shampoos. Because, again, one is a small brand, a small company. We don't want to just be a Me Too company. We don't want to just be making products like everybody else. Right. We want to make products that are unique Hard and different. Hard to compete, yeah. And this was a product like no, no other product on the market. So that's where, that's where it really stood out. Leif, what should people watch out for if they're acquiring a company? What are some of the challenges? You need to look carefully at their uh, – their, 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 
and they present their sales and they present um, their products. Um, sometimes people like to embellish, as we know, and uh, we saw we've seen some of that. Um, we had a, actually a company come try to buy us a few years ago, and they said we want to look, look at your books. But before we look at your books, tell us all the things, all the expenses that are on your books that shouldn't be on your books. Like, are you paying your house payment through your company? Are you buying your groceries? Are you um, are you inflating these numbers here and there? And it was I was shocked, but for me it was like okay, so when. I'm buying a company. I should ask those same questions. Right. What's a legitimate business expense and what isn't? Right. Um, and I, I think I think that I think the understanding of the market was important. I think this company understood they were in a very sort of niche market. They understood that market well, and I think that's that's the important thing about when you're doing an acquisition is doing turning leaving no stone unturned and making sure that, that you feel comfortable with the information you have. So, what made you turn them down? Uh, we weren't. I wasn't ready to retire, and they weren't ready to buy my brand yet. So I think we're 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 a ways away from from that. I love running my company. I love what I do, and I want to continue doing it. Yeah. So what um are the top like three or so sellers on the site? Our deodorant roll-ons are probably our top sellers. Mm. Um, our deodorant, our roll-on, our active, our uh, lavender, and our fresh scents. Our top sellers, our new deodorant, the, the new deodorant sticks, um, are we expect will be top sellers next year. Um, the reformulated sticks, um, they continue to be. Um, the feedback we're getting from them is uh, is extremely positive, extremely, uh, extremely good. It's they're very effective, and as you mentioned in your intro, it's hard to find a really good natural deodorant that and works. That yeah. works. They're out there, but when we I start, tried almost, I think I've tried it. I'm not going to say all of them, but I've tried many of them. Yes. For being patient enough to try ours. Right, yeah. We used to hear that from people, that they, they, that they try all the others and what makes yours different. And you would say, well, it works. Of course, believe me, they're going to say, well, you know, I'm going to try it first. And many times we get some good feedback. Right. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about, because the formulation and manufacturing. Um, so you went from the deodorant crystal to the, the spray to the roll on tell me about some of the difficulties or like what it looks like you want to form a spray you want to form the spray that i use are you at a chalkboard are you writing a notebook what do you what does that creative process look like when you're thinking of how to formulate this well, when i first started formulating jeremy my, my my bachelor's degree is in political science and social work right science was the subject i hated the most in school right so yeah, I'm trying to formulate right. product, figure out, you know, biology and chemistry and percentages. And it was like, I don't know how to do this, but I learned. And I think one can, can self-teach. They can you do a lot of reading. You you hire people who have expertise in that. And, 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 and you, you listen to their advice. And um, I think the key is, is being open to different suggestions and ideas. I mean, I thought when somebody said you can just make – a deodorant spray product that has naturally occurring alum in it, a little bit of aloe vera and some water, and it's going to really work. I said, really? I mean, I was like, is it going to work? So we, we, we tested it, and we were shocked. We gave it to some of my friends who are eat garlic and drink beer and sweat a lot. They, <laughs> stuff really works. And I thought, well, if it works for someone who's got right. some challenging you know, you know, body chemistry issues, then it's going to work for the rest of us. So, so we, we did a combination of things. We... we, we reached out to key people. We listened to them. We asked a lot of questions. That's the other thing. Like, note. who do you reach out to? Like, a scientist? I mean, who's like, I'm a deodorant specialist to to I had, a, I had a gentleman at a trade show who said, I could make this product. And he's the guy who makes our deodorant spray. He said, he said I'm a chemist, and I can make this product. For you. Hmm. And I said, really? I mean, and I thought he was just pulling my bluff, right? So he did. He made some samples, and we talked. And you know, it's a it's a process, and that's where that relationship is so important. It probably took us four months before we actually got product from him that we felt was a good product. We tested a few different things. We wanted to try this and try that. We ended up going back to a very simple. We call it the minimalist formula because right. there's not. Minimal. I think there's four ingredients on here. So it's, it's that's three. It's it's right. mineral salts, aloe, and water, yeah. and that oh, it, it's got it's got uh, a, sl a small preservative. Yeah, in it. three. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, that's everything, and it's it's 
it's amazing how well it works. And it's just, it's water. I tell people you're going to spray, it's going to be wet and kind of messy, but if it's natural, it's a deodorant. It doesn't stop you from sweating, but it, it basically kills the bacteria. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so how many versions did it go through before you actually came to this one? Cause like, you probably went through a million and then you get to this three, it's only three ingredients. We probably had five or six different versions. I mean, and, you know, people always, I find in life that people like to complicate things. And people want to add this to it, want to add that to it. You know, they don't want to keep it simple, right? clean. And sometimes simple and clean is the best way to go. Because yeah. as consumers, we're, we're hit with so much information. I mean, information overload. If I can buy a product, I can read the labels. I can read the label and see what's in it. Um, it's like, boom, I love it that I can, I can make a quick decision because I feel really comfortable about this product. If it's got a long list of things in that, in that product, and I've got a, I've got a thing I'm going to think about. I'm not really sure what's all in that. But so we think simple and clean kind of goes back to authentic and genuine. You know, yeah. it, it, it goes back to my childhood where it's, it's, it's you, you, what you see is what you get. You've got to be able to understand it and feel good about it. And then, you're going you're gonna to buy the product. So, Liv, what are some things that you took away out of this spray that maybe there was, I'm not going to say a, a fight or an argument, but you were like, no, this needs to stay in there, and you end up taking it out. Or there was like a you know back and forth debate about, I mean, obviously you're glad of where it ended up, but at the time it seemed like you wanted to keep something in that you took out. Well, the biggest challenge is preservatives. And people always want to put a lot of preservatives in because it's, you know, if you don't preserve a product, it could go bad. Right. Or if we don't want to have a product that's, that's going bad. So that's the challenge of what kind of preservatives. People want to throw in uh, parabens. There used, to, there used to be parabens. Parabens were really popular back 20 years ago, and they were kind of the go-to preservative. Um, propylene glycol is another thing, and I know some of our competitors use propylene glycol on their liquid product. We don't use propylene glycol. Um, and that's a very good uh, – keeps it all blended together. It helps preserve it. Propylene glycol serves a multiple number of, of uses. Um, so those are the kinds of things. And then, of course, fragrancing. We, we do have a lavender spray mm -hmm. for, for essential oil. Um, and then what, what you were showing was the, uh, the unscented. So we just kept it two versions, the lavender and the unscented. Mm -hmm. So let's not make it. It's not complicated. Let's make it so. For those, for, in a lot of a lot of our customers are people going through uh, treatments, perhaps a, you know, a chemotherapy or something, and they've got to be really careful what they put on their body. Right. Um, and they're going to call us and say, what's in this product? I, I can't, I have to know and understand what I'm putting on my body. Right. Yeah, well, I always recommend something like the, our deodorant spray because it's such a simple, easy formula that they can, they can look it up if they need to online to, to see if it's compatible with their treatment. Right. So, what challenges have you seen with the formulation? Obviously, besides the stick, like that is, is a difficulty in itself, but you have a lot of product lines. What else have you seen that was challenging? You know, it's just our deodorant sticks were a big challenge. Um, some of the baby products have been a challenge. It's, it's, it's The push-pull is the retailer wants a three-year shelf life on a product. So from when you make it to when, it, when it's, it's, it's sold, it's got to be at least a three-year shelf right. life. The more natural it is, the fewer preservatives and chemicals you use, right. which, 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 which Breaks creates down. shelf life. Yeah, yeah. How do you strike that balance? How do you find it's tough? We've yeah. got products that have a two-year shelf life. Anything less than two years doesn't really work because it may take six months for it to get onto the shelf. It may sit on the shelf for a month or two. You don't want to buy a product that's already halfway through its its, its life. Right. Um, it's like, ooh, I'm not sure how fresh it is. We make really small batches, so everything is very fresh in our company, and that's just really important for us. Um, but everything has a three-year shelf life, and we think it's the consumer expects that to happen. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we've had products. We have had products that uh, go bad. In fact, the first company I worked for was a uh, skincare company back in 1993. They're still around today. They make a very high-end natural skincare product. I just started as a sales rep, and one of my retail stores called me and said, this order I got in, all the product has gone rancid. And I said, mm. I went down to the store. She opens up the cap, little black droplets in it. Oy. Black means your oil has turned, right? 
And I thought, oh my gosh, how, how, what happened here? So I sent it back to the company and said, well, we don't use very many preservatives. That happens sometimes. So, you know, that was 20 years ago, but that does, mm. it was, I think today there's, there are preservatives out there that are, that are, that are natural and, and work well yeah. without chemicals. But that's the challenge is finding that balance of what that formula. So it has a long enough shelf life, but it isn't uh, full of chemicals. So now that you have the formula, tell me about manufacturing. What's some of the things you've learned, some of the challenges with that? Um, we use partners in our manufacturing. Um, the key is finding somebody, again, that you feel really comfortable about, somebody who you feel that you can trust. As when we send them a formula and say, this is, this is the formula, it's got to have certified organic aloe, certified organic lavender essential oil, certified organic hyssop. Um, we have no way of really knowing if they're buying organic, which is much more expensive, or just conventional. Right. But the label says it's, it's, it's organic. We expect it to be in there. So we, we have to have that trust yeah. in them. I usually, when I start, I will go and visit the plant and do, you know, visit the, the, my, con- my, 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 my contact there and we'll, we'll do a plant walkthrough. We have engage in lots of conversation. And, you know, sometimes early on, Jeremy, you say, mm, I'm not sure I feel there's a good fit. These people are, uh, seem to cut a lot of corners. They're in a hurry. They just want to make the product. And I think in our case, they're going to cut corners. I mean, it could right. easily cut a corner, and I would never know it. Right. It's, it's about that relationship. And we look at that, that, that relationship and say, okay, do we feel comfortable with this? And we had one recently, it wasn't that many years ago, great relationship, great company. Um, and they just they went through some bad financial. They sold. We didn't know they were being sold. They sold, and they, everything got auctioned off uh, nine months later, and wow. the company went out of business. So one can't predict. They've That's been around crazy, yeah. five years, and you know what's going to happen with with with, with yeah. any any business surprises are out there. <laughs> Sounds like a not fun situation. Then you have to you have to turn around and find someone else to manufacture. That's, yeah, and that's a good three to six month process. That's and that takes a long time. So, and luckily we had somebody else that could make our products. But uh, yeah, we and that's only happened to us once. We've never really been caught without. Anybody can make our there are, there are a lot of really good co packers out there that can make product and understand the challenges and understand the importance of following a formula to the T. Yeah, that's, like, that's, you know what I find really interesting too is the baby safe plastic, and you have a patent on this baby safe plastic. Like most people will just produce this product, send it out, in whatever packaging. What made you even think? to create this patented baby safe plastic we wanted something to be different than what's currently on the market and we felt that um, so many other brands are focusing on the product that's in the bottle yeah and we can make good product in the bottle too Mm -hmm. so how are we going to be different how do we we have to have some unique selling points about our product Mm -hmm. so that baby safe plastic offers that nobody else has has that feature so we thought making a a a product that's natural and organic with baby safe plastic is probably the, uh, the, the, the best combination that a parent would want for their child. Right. I'm just so, wondering if you saw something in the news like baby eats plastic and, you know, gets sick or something. I mean, what sparked? What, what really sparked it, Jeremy, was looking at the data around the amount of bisphenol A and phthalates in infants and children and the, and the rising rates of uh, those the, the, of, of the concentration of those chemicals 25 30 years ago there those chemicals were hardly found in infants and children because there weren't not everything was in plastic like it is today right nowadays those concentrations are huge they lo- are looking at the research suggests that and there's a lot of information online I'm sure you've seen some of it about when, when, when they think that, that young women that are uh, reaching pu- girls reaching puberty at eight and nine and, and overdevelopment at, you know, when they get 18 to 20, a lot of that, that is because of all the chemicals yeah. in food and in plastic. Uh, we've seen some studies that about the sperm count amongst healthy young men mm-hmm. decreasing with each generation. They think that um, 
uh, is attributed to all the chemicals in plastic. There was a study that was done, I believe it was in Denmark a few years ago, and the they have the national net, national health insurance, and they were wondering why they're having so many um, in vitro kinds of treatments for young families trying right. to kind of have babies. Right. Looked at it, and they said that the um, amongst men, amongst young men, twenty five to thirty five. The sperm count continues to come to, to decline to the point wow. where they're having a hard time procreating. Wow! And they think and the country was concerned because they were paying for exor- exorbitant fees for all these treatments for young, healthy people who are out there running marathons on weekends, but they can't procreate and have a family. Right. They, and they want to start that family. Yeah. And I think they looked at the extensive use of plastics and chemicals, and correlated that with the with with the decline of, of male sperm count. And they said, we think there we think there is a direct correlation here amongst all the chemicals that we're putting in our body in things like male sperm count. Yeah. Wow. So, Leif, what are some of the milestones? What do you consider some of the milestones of the business? I think there's um, I think there's, a, there's two or three. One, I think, is the fact that we're now a global brand. We're in 25, 30 countries. Wow. We've really evolved into a, a brand that's out there and uh, developed our reputation. Um, for uh, for a uh, an authentic U.S. skincare branded skincare company, I think the uh, the evolution of the brand is is been a mile. So we've gone from being really very much a, a uh, what some people would call the crunchy granola brand, um, one of those that was just all natural with the look to now more of a mainstream uh, natural, still authentic but a little bit different look. Perhaps the biggest milestone is our B Corp certification. That I think is. Um, it's, At what point did you get that? We got that in uh, in uh, last early of 2014. Okay. So we just we're just a year into it. We are extremely proud. It really aligns with our mission and passion of who we are, our, as an authentic company. And I think that there is uh, there is not a better sort of representation of who we are and our B Corp certification. How did that even come across your radar? To do that, we were aware of B Corp. Uh, we were at a trade show, our big trade show in Anaheim, and a gentleman, a young guy, came up to me, and and he was um, um, in help, helping companies go through the certification process, and reached out to me, and we had a conversation at a trade show, and he kept badgering me. I kept putting it off, but, you know, more work and tons and tons. He he's sending it me seems like a lot of work. Yeah, well, it's twenty pages, twenty five pages of, of forms, and it's and then there's more to come. It's like. It's like, oh man, I, I can't. I don't have time to do all this. He said, "Listen, it's really a fit for your company. It's really." And anyway, so we finally, I finally said, "Yes, it is." With the bullet, yeah. took about six months to go through, collect all the data, um, submit it all, answer all the questions, and uh, finally get certified. Yeah. What about milestones as far as staffing? Because it seems like it was you in a bedroom with a fax machine, right? So how did it grow that way? Well, you know, I, I, I'm one of those who believes that, that the only person that can really do it right and do it best is if you do it yourself. <laughs> I thought you were going to say someone else. No, I'm just kidding. You know, a long time to get past it. I, I know a lot of other people similar to myself say the same thing. Um, you you know, you have to trust people. You have to train people. You have to find people who are a good fit. And, uh, and I've gone through uh, office staff. First three or four I went through were not a good fit. They, they were there for a couple of months, and all of a sudden I realized that they don't like the job. They don't like the products we sell. They don't use the products. They don't know what natural is. One person told me that she had never read a book in her life. She didn't understand why book reading is so important. She didn't like to read. I said, well, how, are you, how do you get educated and informed if you don't read? She said, well, I just watch TV. So I thought, oh, you know, she just wasn't a good fit. For right, her. right. So I think that, that's a lot of it. Um, you know, finding people that have that that passion, that vision, and like working for small companies. Most of the people that I've hired have worked for bigger companies and done their time with larger companies. And they come over to a smaller company. Things are a little bit different. We don't travel business class overseas. I mean, we travel in the in the coach section of the aircraft. We don't stay at the the five hundred dollar a night, four hundred dollar a night, uh, you know, five four star and five star properties. Um, so there's a little bit of a learning curve for them. They have to realize that. We're smaller, we're, we're, we're smaller, and um, at some point we'll probably get there. But this is not a, uh, a five hundred million dollar brand where you can 
have an, an, an endless expense account. Right. But it's the pa- but what they tell me is the passion, and it's the it's 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 feeling good about the products, feeling good about the people we're working with, right. and the feedback we get from our customers. Yeah, I mean, I feel like when you're in a smaller company, you feel like you're making a bigger difference, you know, because you you're not just a cog in the wheel. Yeah, you know? yeah, you, that's, and I think that's that's what many of them tell us that they feel. They feel important. They feel like they're making a difference. Um, one of them told me that the reason he left the company was he expected to be in the inner circle of decision making. Mm-hmm. And he said, I brought more business to that company than they've ever seen before. But they wouldn't bring me to, into the inner, inner, inner circle. And they made some decisions that he felt were really bad for for his department. And I said, you know, I, I listen I, when I hire people and I tell you, you're going to be part of that decision making process you are this is how we work it's it's right. it's the authenticity of the brand so right now how how many staff does it take to run the company we have um we have uh eight staff people and then we have about 40 different sales reps wow we have a lot of contract people we have sales reps out in the regions and then we have um a smaller core staff um, do what we contract out just simply because that's kind of a smarter approach to take um, we're looking to hire a, a marketing person soon. We're going to be doing some expanding and hiring some additional staff here, uh, probably in the next six months to a year. Yeah. So, how do you manage all those staff? You know, that's another job in itself. Well, that's oh, that's you know, again, I thought I could do it all myself. The smartest thing I did was hire a sales manager. Mm-hmm. I can oversee all the the, the the sales team because I was doing it, Jeremy. I was doing a poor job of it. <laughs> I knew I was doing a poor job, but, but by gosh, I wasn't going to let go of that piece. And, you know, letting go is really important. I think the other important piece that, that I've learned is to try to step away, maybe above your business and look at how it functions rather than be in the business all the time. Mm-hmm. I've, I have the, um, the habit of sort of being in the business and trying to make all these decisions and, and, and trying to oversee everything. And that's probably not a good, you know, that's not an effective use of my time and my my, my knowledge and my expertise. I need to be able to step away and look at the different pieces and yeah. say, okay, this is running smoothly. This needs some attention. You know, and, and I think in a small business, that's I would advise people that are running small businesses to be able to try to step away and just look into the business once in a while. And then it really gives you a different perspective. And it really helps the business run more smoothly. So, Leif, what do you feel when with the sales manager who manages like 40, 50 people, what do they do so effectively that make things work well? I feel relief. Um, well, they have that ongoing engagement. Again, it's yeah. the engagement we need to have with our salespeople because um, they need to know that they're important, that their job is critical to, to the functioning of the company. They need to be trained about new products. Whenever there's a change in the label and the look, they need to know what that change is and why we make that change. Yeah, I I, I simply can't do all that. Um, she can communicate and she does it on a regular basis with them. Again, it's about it's about letting go and letting other people do their job. And you know, the way I the way I like to supervise is I'm there to guide and support. I'm not out there to tell you what to do and how to do it. Right. Never liked it when somebody would sort of micromanage my stuff. I certainly don't do that to my. Yeah. Place. What's the toughest part of your job? Probably the toughest part of the job is the financial side of it. It's um, the cash flow, having to deal with the cash flow, having to find funds for uh, new product launches. Yeah. New product launches are expensive to do. We've got to keep doing them. That's part of what makes the brand uh, fresh, yeah. kind of makes it an in-demand brand. Um, with, you know, bank loans and dealing with that and the amount of paperwork that comes with some of that stuff. It takes up so much of my time. And I used to, when I started my business, when I was I was a sales rep, and I love the sales repping side. Now I don't get much sales repping side. I'm going to a trade show in Phoenix on uh, on Saturday. And I can't wait. I get to be in front of <laughs> in, in my retail back retail. to your domain, and yeah, I can sit there and talk all day long with people, and ask them questions, and I say, "You like this product? You don't like this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this idea?" And I'm getting I'm getting invaluable feedback, and I'm getting right. Engagement from people about my brand, and, and they'll tell me that, that many times they'll be very honest and say, yeah. "I think that 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 scent is horrible or <laughs> be great." And you know, you just listen, and you, that's that's our that's our feedback. That's our right. 
we, right we, to the people. That's exactly right. It's important that we have that. So trade shows are re- really inspiring for me. Uh, I get to meet my export partners, many at the bigger trade shows. Um, that's the that's the part I like the most. I think the challenging part is is the uh, the financial side. And for any small yeah. business, you understand that there's always challenges. Yeah. Along. I feel like with a physical goods company, that's got to be a challenge with any physical goods company because you have to put up a lot of money to actually get the physical goods before you sell it. How often do you want to launch a new product? You're like, oh, we want to launch a new product every so you know certain number of months, or only when something comes comes up. How does that work? Yeah, we we look at new product launches that at products that are unique and different that are, aren't out there. We've had some different ideas that have come along about new products that we've said we've shopped the idea around with our with our team, with some of our sales reps, and we've asked them, "Is this a good idea? Do you think this is, or it's an idea that perhaps isn't a good one?" So we wait to get feedback. We wait till we get on something that we think is going to be hot, and then we explore it. You know, again with a number of our team people, we get samples made up, we test it. But we've, we've done a couple of things on the product launch side that um, we've kind of tweaked. We, we have a lip balm, for example. Mm-hmm. Don't sell it in the U.S. market. We sell it overseas simply because going to a health food store, there are probably a dozen different lip balms out there. Uh, it's going to be tough to really sell it. So we have some products that are just just sold on the export side for that reason. Baby as well. Baby is another really tough sell that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we do more on the export side. So some, and we 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 see that some products are just going to be export products. One of the new companies that I'm, I'm I'm about to launch is a private label company. People like our products, but they want to put their label on. Mm. So we're launching a private label company where you could then uh, have that use you could, you could use our formula or something very similar, but put um, Jeremy's natural yeah. products uh, on on the label, and we could sell it under their brand. Yeah. So Something that we get a lot of requests for um, as well. So that's that's some, a new direction that we we're exploring is how we can kind of share without cannibalizing our sales, right? Our, our good formulas. Yeah, that was actually another question I was going to ask about. How do you handle or worry about knockoffs? You know, that was another piece of advice my father once told me. He said, "You know, he says you, people, uh, how are you going to prevent people from stealing your formula?" Hmm. So. I mean, look at it. The world's full of knockoffs. I mean, anywhere you go, there's always somebody making a similar product. Right. And you just simply can't worry about what they're doing. But in every every channel out there, uh, how many shampoos, how many soaps are there, how many supplements? And I go to I go to a, a store and look at how many different vitamin Cs are. There's 12 brands of vitamin C. Yeah. Decide which one you're going to buy versus, you know, the other. Um, computers. I mean, there's a million, you know, whether you buy a uh, an HP or a Dell or um, an Asus or what, you know what I mean. There's always they're out there. I think the key is making uh, is, is is trying to market your products as a brand, and that's what we we, we talk about our brand. Your story. You have an individual story that people can relate to. Story. And, yeah. And from that story, we arrived at this product. We're going to keep we're going to keep formulating it. We're going to keep modifying it. We're going to keep changing and making new. Um, and so we want to get, we want to become kind of the go-to brand for daily use personal care. So your shampoo, right? Deodorant, maybe your your shower gel, um, perhaps toothpaste someday will be all products that we make. I know other brands are are, are attempting to do that, um, but that's there is there is um, yeah. suggestions that that's that's how you build a larger brand. Yeah. So, uh, but but the, for us, of course, we need to stick with with categories in which we can make a product that's unique and different from anybody else. Yeah, I mean, it seems like actually curtailing the knockoffs is exactly what you're doing, which is private labeling. Because why would they spend the time to knock it off when they could probably just exactly. call you and put their label on it, <laughs> and it's high yeah, quality it, and it's it, you it's know a big business. I mean, I mean, you go to the grocery store and, and um, there's a uh, there's a grocery store here in, in Central Texas called H E B. And they have two different private labels. They have their HEB private label, and they have their Hill Country Fair private label, and they, of course, have Heinz Ketchup and Hunt's Ketchup. So they have not one but two different, you know, right. and knockoffs from a sure branded product. So it's big business out there. Yeah. Leif, what are you proudest as far as 
getting into a certain retail or store and seeing your product in that store what what are you uh most proud of as far as retail stores go i think we're in whole foods um, around the country we're in uh in, the, in Sprouts Farmers Markets, which is a, a fast-growing chain of like 200 and some stores, um, we are uh, in most natural food stores across the country. We're in all 50 states. Uh, I think that I think we built a, a reputation for an effective natural deodorant. In fact, uh, we used to I used to go in some of the Whole Food stores, and I would ask, I, I'd do a, a secret shopper kind of a thing, mm. you know, a mystery shopper, and I would say. Uh, um, so which, which deodorant brand do you recommend? And they would say, mm, I think this Lace is, I, we, I hear it two or three times. And, I, and I'd and say, well, why is that? What, what makes it unique or different? You got, you got this brand and this brand. Um, it was interesting because you get genuine feedback. Yeah. What did they and say? Third. And they say, well, you know, they say things like, well, customers tell us it's the most effective. Yeah. We get the fewest returns. This brand, we get more return. We get so many returns on it. Right. So that tells me something. So we're doing something right. Right. And that, that feedback is invaluable as I formulate. Yeah. So how did you get into that first Whole Foods? It was here in Austin. Um, we went to the store and met with the buyer. And, she, you know, she was really reluctant. She said, well, I, I have other, other brands. And I think it was just persistent, persist, persistence. I uh, said, okay. Very professional, of course. And I approached her the next week. And she said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm. Well, she was she was said, well, we have other other brands and they're on special right now, so we're not interested. And it took about three months. I kept going back, knocking on her door, um, saying, you know, here's here's uh, our products. We, we'll we'll um, we'd love to be on your shelves. We're you, we're a little bit different than anybody else. One of the things that we we've always done is the one percent for breast cancer. Yeah. And from the from the get go, my mother's mission was give it was my mother's message was the importance of giving back. Right. And so we've always done a, a breast cancer support program. So I talked about. I said, listen, we're a little bit different than others. We believe in giving back. We think it's important to to do that. Uh, that other brands aren't doing that. And I think she listened to that. She said, okay. I mean, it's just it's just part of, of our story and who, who we are as a company. I went back in another uh, a month later. So it was like, I think I, I must have went there six times in four months. And I finally got my first order after, uh, after four months of, of repeat visits. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's perseverance. And if, I, if, if there's one word I would say to small or to entrepreneurs that are starting off, um, like I was 20 years ago, persevere. Just keep, you know, a no is only, only means you're, you know, you're one step closer to a yes. Because mm-hmm. after 19 knows you're going to get that yes. Or whatever the number is, um, don't give up. Believe in yourself and don't give yeah. up. So with the Whole Foods, what would you say if someone has a product, they want to get into Whole Foods, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages or things they should think about when, if they do get a purchase, there are certain things they should, you know, pay attention to? I think today it's a different marketplace than it was 20 years ago. Um, I think it's tougher to get into those bigger retail stores mm-hmm. um, that they really look to see if the if the product is tried and tested yet in the marketplace. I recommend trying uh, some smaller retail stores, maybe trying some stuff online with Amazon and places like that, and build a following. Use social media to build a following, a loyal following. Um, share your story. Tell people why you make the product. What makes the product unique and different? And use that. And then you, through social media, you'll 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 build and you'll and you'll create that awareness about the product and the brand. Mm-hmm. And then that allows you to go into, go into those bigger retail stores and and present. Today, those bigger retail stores require mega bucks for marketing, uh, significant expenditures to, to free free product fills. It can be in the in the thousands of units. So. If you're just starting up, that can be a pretty high level. Of Even though they'll require you to give, you know, um, to supply thousands of product. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they'll, they'll ask for free fills for. You got to give uh, six units per store, and they've got a hundred stores. That's six hundred units, and you're selling three SKUs into that store. They're going to ask for eighteen hundred pieces for free just to get on the shelf. Wow. You know, if you're if you're starting up, that's a that's a and there's no cash with that, you know. It's a free fill, so that, that's a chunk. That's difficult. But 
And so, you know, the beauty of social media is you can build a following, you can build uh, support for your brand um, and, and, and use that to kind of propel yourself forward. Wow. So when that happens, do they pay you once they sell it or is it just considered part of the business? Well, in, in our industry, there's three fields are in place of slotting fees. Um, oh. You know, slotting fees in a, in a big retailer can be ten or $20,000 per item. Wow. Many of you natural retailers don't charge a slotting fee, but they expect you to give them X number of free products um, on their first order. That's smart on their part. Like, give us free product. We'll see if it sells. If it does, then we'll make another purchase order type of thing. Exactly. exactly. So it's, 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 a bit, it's a roll of the dice. If, it, if they don't think it's sold well enough, you may not hear from them again, and you've just given them hundreds of dollars of free product. You call them like, I want the extra stuff on your shelf. I'll come pick it up. <laughs> yeah it's uh it's 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 you know retail has changed from what it was 20 years ago and mm -hmm. that's um, it's become much more concentrated in the mom and pop stores smaller individual all, individually owned stores are not out there anymore. yeah so Leif, i always ask with inspired insider what's been the lowest point and then how you push through the tough time i think the hardest part for me was going through a difficult divorce back in 1990 uh three young children just a personal struggle yeah it was uh difficult divorce it dragged on for a while it was, it was fairly a fairly contested divorce um, i was trying to i was just starting my business um and i was uh didn't i didn't say really settle until really until early uh, to the mid nineties. And there I was very few resources trying to start my business, traveling across wow. the state, um, being a single father with three young children. Jeez. It was, it was a challenge. How do you do that? Yeah. I, 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 I scheduled my travel. I traveled as the state as a sales rep and I scheduled my travel, um, uh, when the, my children were with their mom and when I, and so I would, I'm, and, and I go leave on Monday and come back on, Wednesday or Thursday from a trip. So on my weekend, I'd be there for them. A couple of times I couldn't get back. They, I couldn't get back into town in time from when school got out. So I had to rain to call the local taxi cab company and the cab company said, yeah, we, you can set up an account and we'll just transport your kids from school home. And uh, um, that's fine. So I, I, I arranged those kinds of things. But it was a, it was a very difficult uh, personal time for me and I felt it's the right thing I did. I had to do it, but my kids were very young and I was just very – you know, it's, it was just it was, it was it was hard to make that decision, but I, I I felt it for my own personal health and well-being. I had to I had to move forward and have no re, no regrets today um, after having done that. My kids are all growing up and, and pretty happy and pretty healthy. You know, that's tough to do at any point, probably. However, you know, old the the children are to to go through something like that. Well, they, they used to say that if you're if you're starting a business, you need to have at least one stable uh, source of income. Sure. And I didn't have that because I was single, so it was just my income. So there were times when I remember having to, uh, we'd, I'd, I'd wash the clothes in the laundromat, and I would just hang dry everything uh, because I didn't have the, the, the extra coins to put them in the, 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 the dryer. Wow. I remember the bath towels, when they hang dry like that, they would just get so stiff and so coarse that when you would first use a bath towel, it didn't feel very good. But, you know, I, when one does what they have to do. Yeah. So that's that's how I looked at it. That's amazing. Yeah, I appreciate you. That's a tough thing to share. I appreciate you sharing that because that's the reality, right, for people. There's It's not just your, you have a business. You are dealing with personal things, you know, along with building your business, you know. Everybody goes through struggles like that. Yeah. yeah that, I'm the only one. Different kinds of struggles, of course, um, people go through financial, marriage. Um, you know, what do you? What advice do you give to someone? Let's say right now they're building their business and they're going through a divorce situation. How did you mentally get through it? You know, it's not easy. It, it's not. I, you know, my suggestion is to try to stay focused. Um, like, did you have someone that you called, like, this person's going to knock some sense into me when you're, you're feeling like overwhelmed or what did you, what did you do? Cause I would feel like for me, overwhelm would like overtake me at that point, you know? 
I, I had some some good friends that I could lean on that could help advise me and, and when I was upset, calm me down and teach sense and help me talk through my stuff and also um, listen to me talk about my business because my business was what was really the thing that was propelling me forward and, and, and creating sort of my inspiration to keep going. And they were supportive and said, Leif, look at the achievements. You've got this new account. You've got that new account. You're launching this. Those kinds of things I think were were really important. And I think that's, I think we all we all have those things and we need to to take advantage of those opportunities where we got a, a friend and listening ear that can can help that can help sort of share help us as we share our, our things. But I think everybody goes through their, their tough times and and um, I think that builds character. I mean I, I really think it does. I think I, I not having gone through that I'm sure I would have been, I'd be a different person today. And I although at the time I wasn't I wasn't grateful for doing Yeah, I would like I don't yeah wish this on my enemy type of thing. Which, it's just one of those things that I think uh, it, it helps helps me it gives me a, a better perspective now, especially when I see people going through that. I mean, they're much more empathetic and much more understanding um, for others. Yeah. So on the flip side, Leif, what's been one of the proudest moments? I think when we hit the million dollar sales mark, mm. like, um, that was that was that was a that, that was an achievement that made me very proud. I mean, I, I said to myself, I can't can't believe I'm selling. A million dollars worth of product. I mean, it's just that is I've amazing. In all these years, and I, I started in my bedroom and waiting for that fax machine to ring, and I, there were times I couldn't pay myself. I had to. I was late on paying my rent, and then when I bought a house, I, I had a struggle with the mortgage payment and taking care of my. You know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Starting out, and you're you're, you're young, and you don't have deep pockets. But I think hitting that at mark was really significant for me because it told me that. Um, all this blood, sweat, and tears that I've gone yeah. through is is uh, is really paying for itself. And, yeah. and, and you know, we're continuing to see significant growth year over year. Yeah. So it allows us to keep growing, and you know, we think we're, we 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 hope to be a, a significant, even a larger brand in the natural marketplace. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that because you know people only see presently what things look like with this probably nice, you know commercial space and everything else and everything systemized and they don't realize you were in your bedroom with a fax machine and packing products I, I want that to be a part of your new employee welcome implementation like they should know where this started and you know so they don't take it for granted that oh you walk into this nice commercial facility you know what I mean yeah and I walk into companies that are small and growing, and I look at some of if they have a really fancy office. I say, you know, I wonder um, they're spending a lot of money on glitz and the look. Um, but really, I mean, I think what's important is put the money behind the brand and the product. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the 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 wealth and the resources will come will will, will come eventually. Yeah. I think the thing I would say for people starting up is. Is the importance of having a, a good, healthy daily routine? Yeah, I, that's. I want to ask what your daily routine is actually with specifically with some of maybe the health-related products, type of yeah. supplements, food. What do you What do you do daily? I eat healthy. I eat you know a yogurt, blueberries, and, and, and cereal in the morning. I eat healthy lunch. I, I'm not a vegetarian. I do eat meat um, at night, but I'm really careful what I eat. I, uh, I work out. I work out four to five times a week. My my wife says, you know, the gym is your mistress, and I said, yeah, it's my. Friend. It's also my time to be by myself. Hmm. I can get inside my head. I can read. I can do those kind of things. I, no one's going to talk to me. The phone's not going to ring. I don't have to worry about answering an email. I'm there with there with, with just myself and having that conversation that one has with themselves about things, work through stuff. But I make sure I go to the gym. Four what do you do? Do you do weights, cardiovascular? What do you? Weights twice a twice a mm-hmm. week. I do cardio, bike or run or something. Mm-hmm. I used to run. I used to do some long runs. I used to do some half marathons. Um, but uh, as I get older, it's more and more difficult for my body to hold up with those long pounding runs. So, right. but for years I've been doing. I started about. I think when I started my business, I started doing a regular workout routine, and I can't I can't emphasize how important it is 
just to keep you healthy. And it, also, it, you know, it's 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 emotionally it clears your head, it gives you a, a clear head, stress relief. Yeah, yeah, it makes you, you can think more clearly and make better decisions when your when your head is, has been cleared. And sleep. I also am a big believer that these guys who say they get by on four and five hours of sleep, no, I don't buy that. <laughs> Got to get a good healthy night's rest. Really be healthy. So, do you take any vitamin supplements? Do take vitamins. I take a, a daily. I take the calcium. I, I take a vitamin D. I take a uh, just a, a sort of general supplements, a handful of general supplements every day. Yeah. So, what? Who are some of your mentors that you lean on when you need business advice these days? And what what do they tell you? You know, I think there, there's a couple of mentors out there. Um, one would be my uh, my grandfather, hmm. O.T. Tweet, who I never met. Who, my, who was my mother's father, very successful farmer, um, businessman. Um, and she would always tell me stories about him and, and when, when I was growing up. And I kind of see myself as, as kind of following in his footsteps. A smart businessman, he looked around to see where there was an opportunity. Uh, he was a very honest businessman. He used to, um, she said, she would tell me that he would take the uh, cattle to market the way you would sell your cattle back then but you put them on the train and you'd ride the train from from south dakota to chicago which is like a two two day train ride and he would wear a suit on that train ride really a farmer with you know cattle in the in the in the back of the train was wearing a suit because he he just saw himself as a su- successful businessman hmm. and he dressed like one and, I, and he was he, he very much was one so he was i think um somebody was a good mentor i think my uh the, the president of my high school, um, that was a kind of a special, it was a private high school that had gone through a serious transformation from being almost a monastery school to my freshman year. They were bringing inner city kids from around the country. It was a Christian high school, but the notion being is troubled kids that don't have homes or have difficult homes. It was a residential high school. We'd bring them in and, and a, a guy named Bob Nervy had started, the, or had just come in as, as the new president. He was a person that, just loved and accepted everybody who was out there, no matter what your background, no matter how much trouble you were in, no matter what kind of person you were. He, he just felt that if we love you and care for you, you're going to try to be an okay person. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll never forget just watching how he operated. And people loved him. Everybody that ever met the guy loved and respected him uh, just because of his, his outgoing approach. Short, heavy set, balding guy was just um, – just he wasn't just loving, but he respected people. Yeah, and even unruly freshmen, sophomores in high school that should have been put in a juvenile disciplined. Team. Yeah, he took them in, and he he so he, he showed them there's another way. And he's a kid who had never had really anybody give him any guidance and support. Um, but that that showed me the power of change that 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 the human being can bring to others. And I think that was something that was just for, as always stuck with me throughout life yeah what about these days who do you turn to if you want some kind of uh advice on the business you know that's uh there's there are uh, branson i think branson is an amazing businessman i really respect what he's done um i i just i don't know how he's done that um i think uh People who've sort of created small businesses and made them grow um, out there. There's a lot of them out there. I really respect and admire what they've done, how they've done it. I, uh, one guy that I really admire and respect is uh, Darren Hardy with Success Magazine. Hmm. Read his stuff. and I, You know, he just shares information and knowledge and helps inspire me to become a better person and more effective in what I do and how I deal with people. Mm-hmm. Like else and it's not that he's telling you what to do or how to do it he's sharing others that are successful right and and how what they what what they encourage you to consider doing or what they guidance and support or suggestions yeah I, I think Darren is as uh, I just admire what he's done how he's built that that whole enterprise up in terms of uh, teaching people and I, I get very inspired and even even and I, I I share the magazines with my with my children who are in their twenties and sometimes they get really upset about their, they work for well, one son works for a car dealership and he said that they have their favorites and, and then the favorites get all the leads and nobody else does and how unfair it is. And I say, you know, read success magazine. You got to believe in yourself 
if the place is not it's so if it's so uncomfortable to work for this place go out and find another job there's other other opportunities don't feel you're stuck right. but that's success i think inspires me and inspires others yeah. you can do whatever you set out to do you have to believe in yourself yeah like this has been absolutely fantastic i really appreciate it i have one last question for you um, but first, where can we send people? Where should they check out Leif's products? Um, as we mentioned, the health food stores like the Whole Foods. And if they if they if they're in a store and the product isn't available, most health food stores can order through their distributor because we're listed with all the major distributors mm-hmm. at Leifs dot com, l a f e s dot com. And if that website, sometimes it'll give you a glitch. Um, just call the eight hundred number. Our customer service people will be glad to help you over the phone if the order doesn't go through on a website but uh, that's where we are we're out there and you can yeah. you find us Leif's, l-a-f-e-s dot com so last question Leif is so what are you most excited about for the future of Leif's I, I'm excited about the new product launches that we're, we're going to be doing this fall the new wet shampoo can you talk about all, all the dry shampoo if, it's the Earthly Delight, the, the company we purchased. We're going to relaunch it with a different brand, a different aroma, and put it in a tube, not a bottle. So it's going to be kind of a different kind of a product. And we're going to create a, a, a hair care system because that's what people really need when it comes to hair care. Um, that's our number one launch. Our second one is going to be the, the Slow Grow product. That um, It's innovative. People are looking for a product like that. Um, women especially who shave their legs, shave their underarms, they, we've talked this thing, this this idea, for probably a year, and people say phenomenal idea. I can go buy the stuff at the salon for thirty five dollars, and it's full of chemicals. Or hopefully, I can buy it from you for a fraction of that, and it's all natural. Yeah. So it's it's our making products that people feel good about, that they will use and they'll share, and knowing it's going to make for a, a healthier individual and a healthier society. Yeah. Less, you know, less disease, less cancer, less of those kinds of things because we aren't introducing toxic chemicals. Right. Yeah. Well, I am a customer and a fan, so I really appreciate it. Like, thank you so much. Jeremy, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you again. So you were saying the craziest thing you forgot to mention. So go ahead. I, uh, I had a uh, – we were snagged in a lawsuit a few years ago around the word organic. Hmm. Yeah, they were suing, uh, they sued a whole number of companies um, because they were claiming their product was organic, but there was nothing in the product that was organic certified. Um, we use the term organic in our in our brand, our brand mark, which is different than used in. And so we were making a claim about the product. It was simply in our grand, brand mark. But we were snagged in this lot, not lawsuit nonetheless, uh, with some of the biggest brands in natural out there. Um, the, we hired the legal counsel. We were spending tons and tons of money. They are about five or six small brands, and they're, they're really the big, big brands of natural. And we all had the same legal counsel folks working together. We were all being charged the same fees. And we said, we, we, we the smaller brands, were saying, listen, we're a tenth, a twentieth the size of these big folks, and you want us to settle this lawsuit for $20,000. For me to write a check for $20,000 is a big deal. If you're a $50 million brand, a $20,000 check is nothing. So anyway, so it dragged on for on and on and on. And um, finally, I just got to the end of it. And I, I fired my legal counsel. And the guy came back to me and said, you know, like, that was the smartest. He, he was really nice. He came back on the private side. He said, was, you, you were smart to fire me because it wasn't worth you paying for it. It's, although it's illegal for you not to have legal counsel in a California lawsuit, you're smart to fire me because you were getting, it was going nowhere and you, you were going to be charged these huge fees. So it went on for a while longer and I just dealt with the people directly. Finally, I got really upset and I said, to, I, I decided I'm just going to, I don't know, something happened that day and I was just tired of this whole lawsuit dragging on and, and more, more legal fees. Um, the, the opposing counsel was trying to get us to pay additional fees. So I went down to, to uh, the health foods where I bought an organic uh, turnip. And I, I put it in a FedEx envelope, and I overnighted it to the lead counsel. I says, you just can't squeeze blood out of a fucking turnip. <laughs> I, was, I was just so angry that we this thing dragged on. And uh, he got it, and I called him two days later. And I said, you know, I'm just going to settle this for $500. His assistant was got on the phone. He said, I've never seen anything like that before. He agreed to settle. 
So That's amazing. It was it was just one of those kind of things where <laughs> I, we I just I, I I you know intuitively I had to do something, and I right. was so frustrated by this process. It was dragging me down emotionally. The financial hit was becoming more significant. Um, so don't be afraid to try something outlandish and crazy no. because. And in the end, the court ruled that you can use the word organic. Uh, they validated our position, like, which is organic in your brand mark is fine. So tens of thousands of dollars later, you know, you seem like one of the nicest people. So if you were extremely upset, it must have been just the worst situation. So, <laughs> I was. I was quite upset. Wow. I love that. Send fat. If you were in trouble, just send someone to turn up and put the note. Yeah, you can't right. squeeze blood from a turnip. Yeah. Thank you, Leif. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thought I'd mention that. So, what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other.